YouTube. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Let's do this Roblox oh. style, Jeff. YouTube. God, that's. Oh, look at those guys, Mr. Baldy. Why do they? Who do plays that? Roblox out there? You play Why? Roblox out there? You know what we're talking about? Roblox. Oh, my gosh. The worst. Oh, there's some super fun games. I love like Roblox. I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. It's fun. But that whole like, oh, no, I'm not going to do it again. I'm sorry we did it in the first place. <laughs> Apologies to everyone. If you're still with us 34 seconds in, you are good people. You are really good Our people. Our retention rates just boosh. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> hey, speaking of retention rate, Jeff, our subscribers have been going at a pretty good clip. So you literally texted me, was it yesterday? I think yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you're like, dude, check out the subscribers. And it's like a huge growth even since then. Yeah. It's, this is really exciting. Yeah, it's it's super exciting. I mean, it's, it's we're not, you know, we're not taking down 10,000 subscribers, 100,000 subscribers just yet. That's, that's not where we are. But for YouTube channels What's this to Babylon grow, 5? As a 30-year-old show <laughs> for what we're doing, that just means that you guys are awesome. And you guys are doing some great yeah. stuff out there. So thanks for all of that. Thanks for telling your friends. You guys know the drill. Jeff and I say it every week. Comment, all that sort of stuff. We love it. We will talk to you. You just guys, you know, you you do that. This this is the main show to me now, Jeff. Like the podcast is just yeah. sort of a thing. This is it right here. So uh, thank you guys. The podcast for is the funnel for YouTube. Like who knew, right? right? Like that's what we're selling. Right, right. But that is there. <laughs> you know, if you guys don't want to, if you don't want to sit and watch us for the next 45 minutes to an hour or whatever it is, you certainly can pull up the podcast feed and listen to almost everything that Jeff and I are getting ready to say, because this yeah. is our behind the scenes recording. This is how we make the show. This is the show about the show. And, uh, in this one here, the YouTube, you guys are going to get the pure unedited uncut version. That means you're going to get the outtakes. You're going to get the bloopers. You're going to get the things that Jeff and I, because here's what happens. You start talking and you go down a certain road and usually somewhere in the middle of that, you're like, I never should have brought this up. And so like that's, yeah, you, you do the magic of editing and you cut that out of the show. Well, you guys get to hear all of that stuff. So, uh, stay with us. You guys, or you are, get cool stuff. You get cool stuff like last week when we have to like go back to the last episode to remind ourselves what we said or right. from a couple of weeks ago where we don't know what a word means. <laughs> And we're mm -hmm. like, what does this even mean? Right. Yeah. You get or some like good stuff. In this episode where I told Jeff last week that I was going to ground his skull into powder, we got a little bit it. that's opening and you guys are going to see how we do it. Even though Jeff's like right there to me in my screen, Jeff, you're below me right now. So Jeff's right there. Oh, okay. But I think when you guys put it together, right Jeff's going to, nope, that way. Yep. Jeff's yep. going to be that way. There you go. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> High think? five, Jeff. I'm even going to do a funny little, wow, that was two high five and white guys. Yeah. There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff. Uh, yeah. With that, why don't we go ahead and jump into this episode? TKO is the episode we're talking about today. The better boxing episode in sci-fi. Uh, I'm excited for this one. Yes. You ready? Let's do it. All right. This is my first time. First time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Brent Allen, and I am watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And my name is Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. That's right. That's that's not a glitch in your stereo system out there, folks. This is how it is. That's right. It's just me. Because Jeff is recovering from having his skull ground into powder, like I told him I would do last week, because he won't stop saying that stupid phrase at the end of the show. So with that, it's just me today. I am one veteran Star Trek. I am one veteran Star Trek podcaster watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. I'm searching for Star Trek-like messages in the series. I'm applying that analytical filter I've gained as a Star Trek podcaster to this show of Babylon 5 to really dig deep and see what the show is really about, see what 
messages and morals it has for us, see how it's holding up a mirror. Is it giving us a, a hope for the future and what's it doing and trying hey, to decide if maybe I should have, you know, watched Brent, it soon. Hey, what? Hey, Hey Brent. Hey, yeah. How's it going? Hey, listen, um, sorry for, sorry for just cutting in like that about last week, you know, the whole, the whole ending thing or whatever. Look, I thought it over. <sighs> that was my screw up, man. I always did have too much mouth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it anymore. Can I, can I sit? Sure, man. It's cool. We're, we're good. Uh, listen, I was just about to do the thing about the game. Why don't you take it from here? Which game? How far were you? Huh? The, the three references to Star Trek. Okay. Okay, cool. Cause we have a couple games. It's so true. I wanted to be clear, but like, I think Brent was probably just saying is that we are some veteran Star Trek podcasters. We watch a lot of Star Trek. We're probably going to make Star Trek references coming into here. So we each have a limit. We can each have up to three and we hit one of those. <laughs> you're going to hear the buzzer. And after that, no more Star Trek for us, but that starts now, but it ends when we go back and decide, you know, if we feel this has a Star trek -y quality to it or not. Hey, Brent, I, did you share any of the cool stuff yet the, that we've gotten from our incredible community? Not yet, man. Why don't, why don't you go for Awesome. It? All right. So, hey, I love, this is like my favorite part of the show. We spend so much time interacting with you. It's the, the best part of everything. Well, there are times where my favorite part of this is watching the episode of Babylon 5. This is one of those times. I also really, really love sharing messages and stuff that you have shared with us. We have a website, babylon5first.com, the number five, the word first.com. And Lauren sent us a message through that website. That's an email that comes through to us. In that email, she shared a thing with us called the Lurker's Guide, which is a spoiler-free recommended viewing order. She said there's some other stuff in there too. I'm staying away from all of that. But she also wrote, Thank you to yourself and Brett for producing this wonderful podcast. I cannot stress how much fun it has been for my spouse and I to listen to the two of you analyze the story and start connecting the dots. Although I would possibly never dream of telling you which dots. Lauren, we're going to connect some dots today. I promise you that. That we are. If you're listening to this on uh, your podcast app, thank you so much. We love it. We also have a YouTube and that's where you get to see Brent and I looking awesome talking about Babylon five. I mean, who wouldn't want to see that? Right. You also get to check out and our who cool sets that we have behind us. Right. We actually, you, yeah, we've talked about it before. Yeah. You've got a great looking Thank set you. back there. Thank you. I mean, you've got some pretty cool posters. The Justin Bieber one, notwithstanding, you've got some really cool posters. <laughs> Justin was a really good drummer when he was like four. Mm. Watch the documentary. He'll get it. But on YouTube, not only do you get to see us, you have, you'll get to be a part of an incredible community. We have a gro rapidly growing community there, incredible conversations that are happening. And I want to take one from way back a little ways. Uh, Jan Anderson commented on Mind War here recently. And Jan says, Jeff, at one of your comments, I laughed loud because you were so close to something. I'm not saying more because spoilers. Same thing, something Brett's, Brett's, oh, I'm going to read that whole thing over again. Here you go, YouTube. Jeff, at one of your comments, I laughed loud because you were so close to something. I'm not saying more because spoilers. Same thing, something Brent said made me chuckle. Again, I'm not saying any more. So much fun to see where you are spot on and where you are not. After all, it's the first time. Jan, that is exactly the point of this show for Jeff and I to experience the show for the first time as spoiler free as we could possibly be. And to let all of you good, lovely folk out there laugh your ever loving socks off at us the entire time. And honestly, kind of get to relive it, I guess a little bit, uh, yeah. you know, cause you can only watch something for the first time once. Right. And now you get to get to see it again through these eyes and, and see what predictions we make and don't make and figure out what we do. So Jan, thank you so much. Thanks for listening and watching. So talk to us on Twitter at Babylon first, send us a message through our website, join the growing community community on YouTube, 
or send us a five-star review through Apple Podcasts, Audible, anywhere you can do that, Podchaser, and we'll share that right here on the show. Jeff, Brent, I'll today, even... Uh, hold on, Jeff. Whoa. I'll even take the non-five-star reviews. I mean, I prefer the five-star reviews. Oh, heck yes. But I'll take the non-five-star reviews too. Like, if you want to leave us one like that, that's fine. We might make fun of you for doing it or not, but you can, <laughs> you can do it however you well, want. Well, honestly, let's be fair, right? We might make fun of you. We might also take any feedback you have very seriously, right? And apply that or we, consider it at least. We might. We might. We'll consider it. I will say <laughs> we will consider it. It's true. We will consider it. And considering things, let's talk about TKO, episode 13. Now, the other game we play is we only know the title of the next episode we're going to watch. And so we guess what we think it's going to be about based on the title alone. Brent, do you remember what you thought TKO was going to be about? Yeah, I said this was going to be uh, the, the inspiration for Voyager's boxing episode. This was going to be a boxer episode. And man, oh man, was I right. I've got to like, nailed it. It had you did be. it. How could it not be anything about TKO? I was trying to figure out how it related to Ivanova's storyline in this one, which you might be able to stretch and pull it. But I mean, it, look, it was a fun episode and it was right there. So I got it. Called it. Yeah, you nailed it. It's so good. I missed it by a long shot. My official guess was going to be something about drugs. And I, well, you know, I missed it by a long shot, except for that little scene where they talked about the slappers and the drugs out of the yeah, med yeah. bay that was literally, literally just like there to fill some time or whatever. But I hoped, I was hoping it was going to be exactly what it was. And that's like some almost underground mixed martial arts, combat sports kind of thing. And well, Brent, your official guess nailed it. Mine was off by a little ways, but listen, if it's been a while since you've seen this episode, maybe you've never seen it before. You're watching along with us for the first time. We're going to tell you what it was about. Give you a little reminder, Brent, why don't you tell everybody what TKO is about? Well, guys, you know, it just wouldn't be an episode of Babylon five. If we didn't start with some new people arriving at the station, usually they're the shady bad guy of the episode, but in this one, they seem like two guys that are pretty jovial and friendly. One of them is Walker Smith a boxer and an old friend of Garibaldi. And the other is Ivanova's personal rabbi from when she was younger. Worf's baby daddy. Actually, I guess it's not Worf's baby daddy. It's Worf's daddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. Fix that. Here you go, Jeff. Yeah. Worf's Thanks. daddy. Worf's daddy. You can edit that. I got, All right. That's a good drop. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about Walker first. He was an up and coming boxer who had just earned his first shot at the title, but the company had too much money invested in the current champ. So when he refused to throw his shot, yes, that's a Hamilton reference folks. Oh, I, oh, I messed it up. Oh, so when he refused to throw away his shot, yes, that's a Hamilton reference folks. They 86 his career and now. He's on Babylon five to fight in what I can only describe as mortal combat in space. But the master Mutai guy says no way, Jose, but that doesn't stop Walker as he issues a challenge straight to the champion, which is accepted. Cue the training montage and mix in a little blow up between Walker and Garibaldi, which a quick apology cures. And in the fight, Walker holds his own and brings the match all the way to a draw which causes the mutador to accept him into their ranks. So mission accomplished. And there's that part of the episode. Now, as for rabbi wharf daddy, he's here to deliver Ivanova's inheritance from her dad who passed away several episodes ago. But when the rabbi finds out that Ivanova hasn't sat in Shiva yet, which is a sort of Jewish mourning ceremony, at least according to the show, he begins to meddle because that's what rabbis do. And that causes Ivanova to lose her crap on him. After some contemplation, she also apologizes and admits that the real reason she hasn't done so yet is because she still hasn't forgiven her father for all the crap that he put her through. Well, Rabbi, well, Rabbi Wharf Daddy tells her that without forgiveness, you can't mourn. And without mourning, you can't let go. So she agrees. And they do the thing. 
oddly while that big fight is happening elsewhere with Walker and we see it bring Ivanova to a spot of grief and mourning over the loss of her estranged father. But when it's all over, she seems a lot better. And that's pretty much where it all ended, Jeff. And it felt that's good. Kind of it it yeah. was a good episode. Jeff, what did you think of this episode, TKO, having watched it for the very first time? Well, first off, this is the episode from a couple episodes ago where the Yum Yum podcast sent us a gif of a guy giving us a thumbs up. That was from this episode. That was Walker Smith. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, he's walking out of the go. bar, gives the thumbs up. So that's kind of cool. There you go. What did I think of this episode, Brent? I think this might be my favorite episode. Oh, so really? Far. I yeah. I and, okay. and it might be like recency bias. Like I I literally watched it like ninety minutes ago. I finished it, mm -hmm. and but I. I loved everything sure. about this episode. There was a theme that carried both of the stories through in, in this, and I think it was really, really, really well done. I'll talk about that in my closing comments, but I mm -hmm. I loved the Mutai. So I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast before, but I've got a history in combat sports. I used to work in professional wrestling. I've been a broadcaster for, for boxing, mixed martial arts, and, and, and mostly pro wrestling, but oh, I love... I love my combat sports and I loved the Mutai. I I would have loved it a little more if it was a little more Kumite, but this is network TV in the mid nineties. So, so I get it. I liked about the Mutai though, that they talked about the Mutari and I'm pretty sure the Mutari weren't a species. I think the Mutari is like a culture, like, like mm -hmm. ninjas or samurai or Aikidoka kind of a thing. I think that was really neat. I did. I absolutely loved Rabbi uh, Yassel, Rabbi, Rabbi Yassel, Worf's dad. And mm -hmm. yeah. there, I, is that one I really count? Because I already said that. I don't that. think so. Does that really count? I was iffy on touching. I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to unark it. There you go. But what I liked, uh, there's a lot I liked about him we can talk in here, but I think, I think that he was a refreshing take on how Jewish people are portrayed in sci-fi specifically. I don't know. I really thought it was great. I love this episode. Brent, what did you, what did you think? Um, I realized after watching, uh, this particular episode, and I really hope I'm not being offensive when I say this, cause I don't mean it to be, I actually mean it to be very praising. I want a rabbi. Like I want this guy right. in my life. Like I, like, I feel like I need him now. I'm not Jewish. I don't know what the rules for that are, but like, like I would go talk to this guy. Like I would go take my crap to this guy and be like, yo, can you help me out? Like, give me advice because I want everything you're dishing out. I want you to meddle in places where I'm being stupid about. I want you to bring me to that spot. Like, like this guy is exactly what a spiritual leader should be. He's not somebody lording it over or standing in a pulpit. He's literally sitting on your couch right next to you in the midst of it with you. He's traveling across the galaxy to get to you, to help you through your stuff. He wasn't there to deliver her inheritance. He was there to help her. Yeah. He didn't even know why he was there to help her, but he knew that he was there. He figured it out once he got there. Like that's the type of a person that I want in my life. That's the type of person that honestly, that I hope that I can be to other people sometimes. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Overall, I wouldn't say this is my favorite episode. I still, I've got to go back to that one that was written by DC fan Fontana. Like, yeah. I loved that episode. Uh, was that war prayer? I think it was the war prayer. Yeah. yeah. Um, that but was, this that one's was excellent. There. So good. Th this one's yeah. definitely up there. This was a lot of fun. It was a good fun episode. It was simple yet beautifully complex. This is one of those apparently rare Babylon five episodes where the a plot and B plot were the exact same theme. And, and I'm going to call, I've, we've talked about it already a few times here, this theme of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it ran from, from Garibaldi. We saw it. We saw it with Garibaldi. We saw it with Walker. We saw it with the rabbi. We saw it with Ivan Nova. We saw it with Sinclair. We saw it all throughout and we saw how it, uh, it, it impacts stuff. Like it was such a great theme. Absolutely. And, and we'll talk more about that and the specifics of that as we get into our closing thoughts, but overall, Jeff, I really, really enjoyed this episode. And like, it's hard not to compare this episode 
to that Voyager episode where Chakotay's boxing in his dreams because they're both boxing episodes, you know? Yeah, but I think they're I think they are very very different. Very different episodes. But yeah. so, on the sheer like it's a boxing episode, this is what it should have been. And yeah. this one came before think, that one. So they should have watched exactly. this episode when they were writing that one and gotten a one of the things I love. One of the things I love about pro wrestling is that it it tells very simple stories, but it tells stories that are universally like accepted and understood. Uh-huh. And it tells them through <laughs> the universally understood and accepted language of violence. Sure. Like there's a real language there. And that's, I think that's what that Voyager episode was thinking it was going to do. That's what this episode did. It told a complete story in that fight, in that fight between Walker and, uh, and Gior. Like there was a complete story that happened there and it was just, oh, it was yeah. really, and it, I mean, I, I use it like a, I don't know, like an excuse or something, a cop out, but like for network TV, this was so well done. Mm -hmm. Like it was violent. It was bloody. Gior had that white blood that was coming down. Even Walker had the eye, the eye swelling shut. Makeup was so good in this. Oh, that, that whole, that whole match was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, Let's dial in, um, cause I think this is one of those clear times. Our conversation can focus on each story. Um, so let's just take them one by one. Let's take Walker's story and go yeah. through that. Um, so Walker comes in, I didn't hate this guy, you know, like sometimes you get the guy from the past coming in and you're like, dude, I don't like you at all. I don't want you around. Right. Like I liked this guy, you know, uh, he comes in, he had, a, he had a real story. I, I just read a story about a, uh, she's a, a Hollywood child, like a second or third, okay. she's a third generation child in Hollywood. And her grandmother had her entire career railroaded by a very famous director. And I don't want, I don't want to put that juju out there, yeah. but like, like it was very well known that she just had her whole career just junked by this guy because she didn't do something he wanted to do. And I don't remember what it was. I don't think it was anything funny, but it, yeah. you know, uh, it, it was just, when you talk about the idea that somebody can railroad your career and you know, now these guys talk about, about, uh, framing him for stuff and making him look like he's doing stuff. He's not doing, you know, I used to work very closely with the NFL and mm-hmm. I will never accuse an organization of purposely tanking somebody's, uh, P tests to, you know, like I'm never going to right. accuse them of doing that, but I have seen people get on the wrong side of the organization. I've seen players get on the wrong side of the organization and that guy's looking for a job and it's yeah. not in the league, <laughs> you know? Well, I think, I, I mean, this WWE told this story f- like four years after this in 98, when you had the uh, Helmsley and Stephanie McMahon and Vince McMahon being the kind of the corporation. Mm-hmm. And in 98 at Survivor Series, the WWE or d- at the time WWF championship was vacant. They had a mm-hmm. big tournament. The Rock won and then revealed that he was the corporate champion. And they mm-hmm. had a whole like ongoing storyline where like mankind who's just like, he was this gross, out of shape looking guy who's actually just a complete legend in mm-hmm. pro wrestling. But he wanted to be champ and do this, but you can't be the champ. You're not the the corporate image that we're looking for. Right. And that whole if you and then The Rock, it was a great story that happened. But it was that same thing. You cross the company and you're done. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter how good you are, what mm-hmm. you've earned or whatever. You're, they'll find whatever it takes. And here in the Babylon Five world, it means doctoring up some urine tests and calling you a calling you a cheater and a criminal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so he goes in he goes to the mook i think i said that right or muda dough or something like that yeah um and he's like hey i want to come join you and they're like no and he they calls them he calls them snakeheads and i'm like i'm looking i'm like why are you calling them snakeheads like they kind of had the slits in the nose but that's about it i didn't see a whole lot of snake to it yeah whatever um, I feel like they were just coming up with like, eh, this sounds derogatory. It's uh, it's uh, here we go. It's spoonhead. 
with the Cardassians. I had oh, that this same sounds thought. derogatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had that same thought. Uh, and uh, they say no, which I was like, okay, that's a little racist, but whatever. And there's themes of racism through this because I mean, that, there's that one dude who's like, we're not going to let you humans come in and take this from us too. This is ours. And I'm like, who's ours? Because it seems like it's a mixed group anyway. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier, where I think that's the, uh, you know, it's like being a samurai or an Aikidoka mm-hmm. or something where, yeah, anybody can come, but you have to earn your way here. And they just don't yeah. want to give humans a chance to earn earn their way here. Mm-hmm. Did you know a little bit of trivia here? I don't know if you're much into boxing or anything, but uh, Walker Smith, mm-hmm. that's uh, Sugar Ray Sugar Ray Robinson. That's his name. Yeah, it's his real name, right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I knew that. I thought it was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. There were a couple times in this episode that I like had to pause and rewind. I'm like, is did they is that? And that was that was one. I'm like Walker, I know Walker. Oh my god! Oh nice. Yeah. That's that, I thought that was a really cool thing. That'd be like somebody coming in and going Cassius Clay. It's like oh right hey, exactly. I know who that is. You know that they, name. It's not like they like like could have reversed the name like Smith Walker or you know like something like. like well, I I think most people don't know that. You yeah. know what I mean? They they know Sugar Ray as Sugar Ray, not the band Sugar Ray, but like the actual legendary fighter. Mm-hmm. But I thought I thought it was a really cool, cool piece they did. One thing that I I will nitpick in this was uh-huh. the ring they had him fighting in. How unpractical is that thing, right? Like uh, yeah. these little like glass and neon things that I mean, if he fell into those and they they were, they had gaps in them. Mm-hmm. And here's where I'm really going to nerd out. So in professional boxing, rings mm-hmm. are generally 20 feet by 20 feet, sometimes as small as 18, sometimes as big as 22. Okay. This was a 12 foot by 12 foot fighting space. It's wild that I know that, but when you go to amateur, amateur can be as small as 16 by 16. Mm-hmm. And in pro wrestling, they often have 14 by 14, but the standard, like if you watch WWE, they're wrestling in a 20 foot by 20 foot ring okay just looking at where the people were positioned in there this was clearly a 12 foot by 12 foot fighting space which is not adequate for the kind of fighting they're doing here that's not enough room i thought right so that but who cares they made it work they had some great camera angles it was fine i'm gonna nitpick something for you the sound effect of every punch and kick in this episode was killing me it's like they had one one sound and the dude was just sitting there with his button and every time they did something he just hit and it's the same <laughs> like you know that old gunshot like from the old 60s the pa-ching, right pa-ching. yep it's like no gunshot ever sounds like that ever <laughs> you know it's just but like let's like, do that with a pump on it right right or like you, you know some people have a really hard time with uh uh like sitcoms that use laugh tracks and stuff in them Yeah. 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 I can understand that they have a problem with that. Right. That just keeps uh, going, doesn't it? It really does. You're gonna have to <laughs> kill Yeah, I that. killed that thing. <laughs> but it was it was killing me in this episode. I was like, come on, guys. A couple more little little points. Uh Garibaldi. Garibaldi yeah. was an incredible corner man. He I mean every, every everything that he was yelling at him was was great tactics. It paid off when he actually went to the inside it made a difference i thought that was awesome but gior who was the champion mm-hmm. at first i was looking at him and i'm just like i i'm not buying this guy yeah. as uh as a big martial artist who played him so i go and i look and i'm like no way this is james jude courtney that yeah. name may not ring a bell for you unless you're a fan of the halloween movies that have come out in the last few years he's michael myers Whoa, really? Yeah, in the most recent uh, Halloween movies, he was actually nominated for Best Actor by Fangoria in 2019 for uh, for the Halloween movie that came out just, uh, I think it was in 2018. This guy's the real deal. He's uh, been a stunt guy. He was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He's an experienced martial artist. So it, in this one, I'm going to blame the costuming and the makeup for making him not look all that tough because... If uh-huh. you can be like in your mid sixties and play Michael Myers and it's realistic, yeah, you are the real deal. I also looked him up and I found him on the Babylon five fandom wiki page. 
Mm -hmm. I would like to read to you verbatim what the Babylon five fandom wiki. Now these wiki pages are usually pretty complete where they're born, their kind of whole life story, who they're married to, who they're divorced from, who they're married to again, who they're divorced from again, the names of all their kids, any connections that they have to the show with any guest star, like they're usually pretty replete. I'm going to read to you buckle in folks. All right. I'm going to read down. verbatim what the page says. James Jude Courtney is an actor. That's it. <laughs> that's the it. End. it. That's it. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> All righty. You, wiki. <laughs> All right. He's an actor. I thought he was an extra. Honestly, maybe he's a stunt coordinator, but nope. He's an actor. Got it. Wow. Well, yeah, good it. for him. That's great. Got it. Okay. So whatever race he is, their blood really does look like he's doing blow. Oh yeah. Like just all over, like total, yeah. like, like Scarface, just all over the place. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, oh, I noticed a, uh, uh, Centauri in the crowd. Did you notice him? I only noticed him because of his little bump of hair that he mm, had. Okay. And I went, oh, he's apparently not that important. It's a little that was my clue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Garibaldi. Now, Jeff, I've been on this the last couple of episodes. All right. A couple yep. episodes ago, we exactly had Garibaldi the drunk and they turned around the very next episode and might as well have not even happened. I loved that. They just referenced it. I didn't need them to drill down on it. This is what I've been saying. I didn't need, I don't need a, a complete and total, you know, B plot every episode dealing with this. That's not what I'm asking for. I just want some consistency with the character. And when he comes in and they're at the thing and they're at the, the bar or the restaurant and Walker looks over and is like, dude, is that water you're drinking? And he's like, yeah, I had to lay off the rocket fuel, you know? And I'm like, thank you. Like it's, yeah. it's now a part of his character. Let that be a part of his character mm -hmm. and not pretend otherwise. So I was, I was incredibly uh, grateful for that, but also I really want one of those burgers. So thank you. I, that's one of the spots I went and like rewind and look back. I'm right. like, I, I feel like there's nothing on that burger, but I feel like it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you guys at YouTube, you're looking at me right now. You're like, yeah, Brent likes food. Yes, I do. I want to try one of these burgers. <laughs> yeah. Sign me up. I'm in. Right. right? And the tubers uh, or the whatever. Like, yeah, I'm I'll eat that whole thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, I have a, I have a question for you. Right. What does this phrase exactly mean? Stroke off. This is a family friendly show. This is a family friendly show. So I'm so. tossing it to you to answer because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, if this were like the early to mid eighties and we were in Canada, I mm -hmm. would say it's about the same as take off, take off to the gray white North, take off. Somebody out there, somebody out there hears me. They know what I'm talking about. I hope. Uh, it's such a weird phrase. It's like, I love, I love when sci-fi tries to be cool and not right. cool. in like a, Hey, look at me, but like in a, Hey, look, we know what pop culture is going to be like in the late 2200s. They're going to say stuff like this. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. no, just, uh, just, it's fine. We, we, we get mm -hmm. it. Do what you did with rabbi Yossel over here and just let him wear a suit for men's warehouse. Like mm -hmm. it's fine. <laughs> we follow. Dig it. Um, I'm going to circle back to this later, but I just, I want to bring it up here. Um, when Walker came back to Garibaldi after he kind of blew up at him after saying stroke off and stuff, and he comes back and he's like, yeah, yeah. my mouth, my mouth shut off and I got in trouble. He's like, I'm sorry. He got to that spot. Like it was such a dude thing. But like Garibaldi's just kind of looking at it. like he's kind of he's still miffed at him. You can kind of tell like at the beginning of the scene and he comes in, he goes, I'm sorry. And Gar Garibaldi didn't even say anything. Doesn't even say anything. He just nods his head at the chair. Like, yeah, come on, sit down. Now we're best friends again. Yeah. You know, and like. I don't know about you, Jeff. That's the way I always grew up with my friends. 
Like totally, we didn't hold totally. grudges. Like, yeah, you you screwed up. I'm mad at you, dude. I'm sorry. Can we? Yeah, man. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's go. So what are we doing? Let's. I, like the only time we held a grudge is if you didn't own up. You know, I mean, yeah. that was the thing. You screwed up. You did the thing. You show up. You, maybe you wait a day, and then after yeah. it's like, dude, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. And they're like, yeah, you are an idiot. Okay, get over here. Let's go. We got GI right. Joes to play with. You know, or whatever. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> right. I just. Yeah. It, it like I like it was it was just such a moment that I was it, it was so true. I felt to like two guy friends, you know. Uh, and I'm I'm sorry, I don't mean to exclude female friends out there. I'm just not a female. I don't know what it's like to be a female with female friends. So maybe they're like that too. Not usually, from my observations, and I say usually, I'm not putting a blanket statement right. out there. But you know, it it was it was like I said, so true to my personal. Uh, my personal background. I thought I thought Walker and Garibaldi were awesome together, and I I don't know it would I don't see the path that necessarily brings Walker Smith back onto the show. It'd be cool mm -hmm. if he did come back, but I wonder if the actors have like they had real chemistry. They mm -hmm. you know all that stuff worked. Like when he's sorry, man, my mouth just go yeah, get over it. like that worked. It wasn't two actors working; it was two buddies hanging out. Mm -hmm. And so I just I wonder if there is like I don't know. Background kind between of, them or if they actually are buddies or something. I mean, it's like if you remember the show Friends, right? Um, I and rightly so. Like, I always felt that Matthew Perry and dude that played Joey. Yep. And they <laughs> tried to get to do a bunch of other shows. <laughs> Matt LeBlanc. Matt LeBlanc. That's him. There you go. Uh that those two guys. They were roommates in the show, or at least for the first several seasons of the show. They always seemed like a much better pair of friends than any of the rest of the of the cast. You know, yeah, like, like the they had a different friends. chemistry, right? Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that the others weren't. Just those two had had a thing that was just viscerally different. It was that that same buddy, you know, the bromance that we see. The, yeah. the Tom and Harry, the Miles and Julian, the, uh, oh, who was the other one? I was just thinking about it the other day. Oh, Trip and Reed. Trip and Reed. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Kirk and Spock, yeah. honestly, like, the, yeah. you know, we've always had those. Um, I, yeah, I loved it. It was, it, they were good. Yeah. Really good. And then Zima. Want to dive in? Oh, and Zima. Zima. I just, there's just <laughs> Zima. My only and question is how huge. much uh, it was huge. How much did they pay to put that sign on the bar? Is what I want. I'm going to guess know. just about enough to put him out of business because I don't think Zemo was around a lot longer than that. I don't <laughs> think so. I don't. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it's that was a thing. It was really bright, really, really bright. It it took up two thirds of the screen. Like he had one third with Walker Smith mm -hmm. giving that awesome thumbs up, and then the rest of the screen was Zemo. Right. I mean, you know, we've heard from so many folks out there about how low budget this was. They're working with such a, a fraction of the budget that other major sci-fi shows are working with. They had to pay for the show somehow. So, I, right. you know, no hate. I just want to know how much they actually paid for that. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, transition. Here's a transition because yeah. because you were just asking about going to Ivanova. I want to talk about Sinclair just for a moment. Um, Michael O'Hare, I think, is the actor's name. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Is he just super, super stiff or is he just a bad actor? Like we're 13 episodes into this right now and I can't decide if I think he's a good actor or if he is really a good actor, just playing a very stiff character. And I don't know. So I think, and this sounds like a cop out answer, but I think part of it is that uniform does not look comfortable. It looks stiff. Garibaldi's stiff when he's in it. Mm-hmm. Ivanova's stiff period. Like that's just kind of how she carries herself. I don't know, Brent, that's a good question because I think we've now seen a couple of times recently, we've seen Sinclair be a dude, right? Like when mm -hmm. Catherine Sakai is around, like he's comfortable in himself with Garibaldi. We've seen him like, you know, let loose a little bit. We see it in here with Ivanova and mm -hmm. he's still just so stiff and uncomfortable. Yeah. Uncomfortable. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. best thing I, he just doesn't look like, I don't know. Yeah. That's it. I, I hope he loosens up. Cause if we've got to stick around with this guy for five seasons, like 
I yeah. hope he loosens up. Now you're really like giving me a lot of like I'm really this really kind of hit me honestly because I think you said a thing that I've been thinking and didn't maybe want to admit, but mm -hmm. he's. I'd say he's like 80% great for Sinclair. You know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. he's fine. This is good. I get him. I fine, but mm -hmm. there's a critical 20% that, well, if you, are there other people that were kind of stiff and stoic and whatever, who still like were able to just kind of be normal and hang out. Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> you know, and, and it wasn't, even in the first season, you know, mm -hmm. where he was still being quite military and what he did still loosened up a little bit and maintain, but he mm -hmm. maintained that professional decor up until, right. you know, the final episode when he finally played poker with everybody. But yeah, with Sinclair, he's not letting loose at all. Right. Right. Or okay. Let's that, get, got it. Uh, yeah. I'm going to keep that. Like, and I'll probably cut a lot of this out for the podcast. Honestly, I'm just really <laughs> thinking through yeah. maybe. Maybe a lot of it's just him feeling the weight of command all the time. And he's trying to portray that as the actor. Jeff, I just don't know that he's a good actor, man. Yeah, like I, I really just not admit that. I really just don't know that Michael O'Hara is a good actor. And I don't know, like we know that oftentimes in sci-fi shows, it takes people a season or two to get to know their character enough before they actually start playing their character. Well, yeah. Right. And I'm not going to list them all because you're going to buzz me like 18 times and I'm almost out <laughs> of my buzzes anyway. So, um, like, like I hope that he gets to that spot where he becomes a much better. I don't know that this show could be led by a guy who is a bad actor like that. Who's just so broadly stiff, you know? Um, yeah. So I, well, I, I think hope too, something good happens with him, but, and we think about uh, Garibaldi, and we talked about mm -hmm. Jerry Doyle and the incredible job that he did in Survivors. When we saw him in uh, Midnight on the Firing Line, and we saw mm -hmm. his second favorite thing in the universe, you and I talked about just how unbelievable and ridiculous and horrible that was. So we went from yeah. a guy, had no idea who his character was, was kind of showing up for a job. He probably thought this show was going to get canceled. You know, yeah, I'll do whatever, I'll give it a shot, mm -hmm. figure this out to just like nine, 10 episodes, maybe 11 episodes. And he's like, I've got it dialed in. I got it yep. figured out. And, and here's depth. Sinclair's had a and he, ton and, and, of screen and, and, time. And to that, I'm sorry, to that, like with Garibaldi, Jer, you know, o O'Doyle, he knows where Garibaldi's line is between jokester and station security. I'm a guy who has my own demons and my own problems, but I'm also, I, I'm a guy who laughs at duck Dodgers as well. Like, He's got that. He's, he's found that happy spot right there. You know? Yeah. And uh, Michael Harris just hasn't found it yet with, with, uh, Sinclair. Like he's got this beautiful, yeah. deep voice, this very commanding voice. He's got the, he's got the look. It just comes off. So just stiff. And I just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't That's where I am right now. Who knows? People out there are yeah. like, oh, just you wait. He's going to be amazing. Or he's going to have this one episode that you're just gonna it's gonna blow your yeah. socks off and you're gonna think he's amazing cool yeah, maybe it's the next it's, one doyle did it for us right so yeah. here i mean we know it can happen so yeah. this would have been or maybe cool it's in season two three in. or season yeah. four like whatever yeah. i hope it's not that far out hope it's not that far out all right ivanova let's talk about ivanova because honestly this was much the much more compelling story yeah to me and personally. it's ivanova ivanova yeah, what did i say did i say ivanova you did yeah you've been ivanova yeah yeah, Ivanova. Um, but so, and in fairness, I learned a thing about Russian culture in in this where Ivanov is the name, yeah. but it's Ivanova because it's a woman, Ivanov. Right. Yeah, right. I, I never knew that before. Mm -hmm. so I did. That, I, <laughs> Sorry. I did, I did not. <laughs> yeah, it was. I I hadn't thought about it with her name before but once he came out and he talked about about ivan or ivanova or Iv ivanov however he said his, mm -hmm. said his name i was like oh yeah that's why it's like that but what i noticed though jeff my subtitles still had everything listed for her dad as ivanova oh and i was like no yeah. that's not right that's not what he's saying like like cut it out yeah the subtitles got it wrong anyway uh so we learned something about her that we never knew we knew she was russian 
we didn't know that she was Jewish. Yeah. That that was part of her makeup. And you talk about seeing the way that Jewish people are treated in sci-fi, especially. And I want to ask you about that, Jeff, because I can't think of a time where I've ever seen somebody who is specifically Jewish in sci-fi. So I thought about this by that when you talk about that. So the first thing that comes to mind for me, and this isn't going to surprise anybody out there, but in Frank Herbert's last Dune book, his last book, Chapter House Dune, there's a group of people that are Jewish that are hiding and running away from the big bad guys, the honored matres. And the, the leader is called, you know, imaginatively the rabbi in there. And so that was my first thing. And I started thinking about it some more. And what I kind of came to is in a, the couple instances I'll share here where there are Jewish people in sci-fi, they tend to either be cowards or they tend to be completely against anything new or different. So cowards, Firefly had two, I feel explicitly Jewish characters, Amnon and Mr. Universe. And both of them took a grand total of like four seconds to cave and give Mal and the crew up. It's like, as soon as, oh, you, oh yeah, this is the, the transaction we did. And if, the other part of it too is most Jewish people or Jewish archetypes or stereotypes are, are merchants of some kind. Yeah. But the ones that are against things that are new, you got the rabbi and Dune who, I mean, mm-hmm. they're literally in a ship called a no ship that can't be sensed picked up on scanners. It can't be seen. It's flying through parts of the universe. No one's ever imagined. And he's still talking about like, well, you know, we need to, you know, worry about getting to Jerusalem to do this thing. It's like earth hasn't even been around in millennia. And he's so against anything new, but also, uh, in V the series, the mini series V I brought up, there's a great character named Abraham in there who just outright tells you the theme, you know, of like, Hey, these are fascists coming in to take us over, but he is the same where they're like, we have to fight this way and we have to use these weapons. And he's like, no, no, you have to stick to the old ways and do stuff. So I, in my experience in sci-fi, Jewish people aren't portrayed well, but Rabbi Yosel was incredible. You talked about it in your recap, but like at no point, Ivanova is basically saying, ah, I mean, like I'm Jewish, but uh, and mm-hmm. not even a second of judgment. He's just like, I mean, you can see the disappointment mm-hmm. on his face, but he's like, okay, well, if you need me, this is, this is where I'm going to be. And I'm, I'm yeah. here for you. Oh, so good. It's uh, dude. Sometimes that's all people really need is a, uh, Hey, I'm here. I'm not going to push myself into you. I'm not going to pressure, but if you need me, I'm here. And that's why I'm here for you. Yeah. And it worked great. He, he pressured, I think he definitely pressured, Mm -hmm. but in a really cool and and compassionate way, like it was crystal clear. He, he wanted her to sit Shiva. Like he wanted that to happen, but also he just wanted her to be taken care of, Mm -hmm. you know, like ultimately if I, if it was for her, he wanted it for her. Exactly. It wasn't about him checking some, you know, one of the things about Judaism that I know I know a good, good amount actually and about this specifically, I've got thoughts we'll get to, but in the Torah, it specifically mm-hmm. says that the people, the chosen people, the, Ju- the Jewish people are all one. So mm-hmm. what, ha- what one does, what happens to one, everyone does happens mm-hmm. to all of us. So like sitting Shiva, sitting Shiva, she doesn't technically have to do it. Someone else could mm-hmm. sit Shiva and that counts. That, that, that's oversimplifying it. But if someone else goes and sits it, then all, all of the people have had the opportunity to sit. So and I, I think let he me got ju- that. Let me just clarify this. Cause this is Brent, not knowing Jewish culture hardly at all. Shiva is a real thing. Like the sitting Shiva, yes. like that's what, like, was it accurately described and portrayed in the episode as far as you understand? Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty okay. close. So sitting Shiva normally, uh, normally takes, it's a seven, it's seven days of mourning, but okay. there are there's some rules I don't fully understand, but if it's been a while, if the body has already been buried, some stuff that seven days can shorten, mm-hmm. but the, the gist, like just the gist of it is exactly what it was sitting down, letting people swing by telling stories, crying, celebrating, 
mm-hmm. just mourning in more it's traditional... like a seven day wake or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. much. And they're, they they're generally generally they're pretty low key. They are um, uh, respectful, reverent. You know, there's there's mm-hmm. often quite a bit of praying that happens in them. Um, but yeah, they, they did a good job. Traditionally, too, like it's done literally sitting. And oftentimes the morning people, the family that are left mm-hmm. will actually sit like on the floor or on a low stool. They will sit low to kind of demonstrate like we're low. We're, you know, we're feeling mm-hmm. down literally right now. Right. And then people can swing by. I, I wish like it was cool jumping ahead a little bit. I thought it was really cool that Sinclair was there when she was able to sit. Mm-hmm. And I know why he wasn't but I really wish Garibaldi could have been there. Yeah. Yeah. So about that scene with, with Sinclair being there, I thought this was super cool, like super cool. And I think this was more for us as the viewing audience than it was anything else, truthfully. But when she goes to read that poem or the prayer or whatever it is that she read, she said, I know that we traditionally read this in Hebrew but I'm going to read this in, in English so that my friend can be a part of this. Yeah. You know, like I think most people would go ahead and read it in tradition and their friend, like knowing, Hey, he's going to be here. He's here in spirit. He's going to get to experience this for exactly how it is. He may not know what's being said, but he's around and he's here in spirit and heart. And that's cool. She didn't want him to feel left out. She wanted him to know exactly what was happening. And she said, for his sake, I'm going to break with tradition and do this. And that's so respectful. That's so much love. That's so much thinking about somebody other than yourself, you know? And I, I just loved that moment. Like it's really stood out to me of like, you don't have, you don't have to sit in tradition all the time. You know, and it, it, obviously you think of Fiddler on the Roof. Tradition. We do this for yep. tradition. And like, but it's okay to break with tradition for the sake of people. You and know? Inclusion. Inclusion. Exactly. And being welcoming and and frankly, just being a good friend. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that's the that's the mantra of, of things. That's how I want to be. That's the type of person that I personally want to be. Yeah. You know, uh, is a person who thinks about others and loves others and does things to include others to be all things to all people as another famous Jew once said, well, you, you, know? you had talked about earlier about wanting a rabbi. And I think there's a lot, there's a gosh, the Jewish faith just has so much in, incredible support built into it. So mm-hmm. the prayer that she says at the end is called the Kaddish and mm-hmm. uh, Kaddish is a, it, it, it's probably I don't know. I mean, in my circles, right? So, I mean, and these are pretty tight circles, I guess, compared to a lot of people, but it's a pretty well-known, well-known prayer. And it, it's, it's, it's specific for mourning family that, that have been mm-hmm. lost. Uh, traditionally, it's actually prayed every day for the first 11 months after someone passes, then nothing. And then on the anniversary, um, uh, there's a name for the anniversary. I forget what it is, but on that day they, they pray it as well. And generally they pray it in Mignon, which is a group of 10 people. And it used to be, I don't know if it is now still, but it used to be 10 men specifically that would have to be there to, to pray it with you. The Jewish faith for being one of the oldest continuously practiced faiths in the world has evolved a lot. And there's a lot of different sex off of it. And so, I mean, what I'm sharing is what I know from, mm-hmm. from, from people that, that I, that I understand their, their traditions and their faith. But I think that this episode did a really, really great job of taking an accurate portrayal of, of Jewish mourning and then using it to tell this incredible story and make a really strong statement. And I think part of the statement we got to talk about is just what a great leader Sinclair was <laughs> through all. I mean, Ivanova was a great friend, but when, when rabbi goes to Sinclair and is like, Hey, this thing happened. And he's like, Oh my gosh, I had no, no idea. All the time is fine. And then he calls her in. And the yeah. first thing he says is I'm so sorry. I'm 
I'm so sorry this happened. And Ivana was pissed. She was so <laughs> mad. I was like, what do you mean he told you? Right? But she he was just being a being a good guy. Yeah. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Did you yeah, catch? Uh, I was gonna say, did you catch what uh what Ivanova said to him at the end when he's like she's like, Okay, I'm ready to go back to work. He's like, Good, these double shifts are killing me. Right. Did you catch she what, goes, what she said? Remember that next time Catherine's on the station or yeah. Miss Sakai or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought Cra- that was funny. Cracked me up. Um so this was an episode that pulled threads from multiple previous episodes in. And I don't think that I had realized everything that had gone on with Ivanova's family. Cause we didn't get really much new information at all. This is all stuff we knew. We're just now dealing with it, but they, they were very nice to recap it for us. For those who might've missed Mm it. Ivanova's father died on a deathbed. And they got to have that last final communication. She like literally witnessed him giving up the ghost. Yeah. She had a conversation, I think in the first episode with Talia winters about her mom being uh part of the psych thing and having to go into hiding and decide to take, did she do the medicine? I think she did. Yeah. She did and then the it, drug re- it wrecked her. Suppress it. Yeah. And then right. She so she had that life. Yeah. And then her brother who went off and I don't, I feel like we knew that too. I don't feel like that was new information. Mm-mm. Uh, her yeah, brother who went before. off and, and yeah, and he was killed during the Mimbari war, but to bring this all back and to go, she's still holding on to this. That wasn't done. And to give her a spot to let this go and to talk about why she hasn't let it go because she still hasn't forgiven her own father to see her get to a spot where you know, she goes through the, the Shiva process and she just has that moment where she breaks down for 32 seconds, Yeah, you know? And, and it was, it was like this release for her, like it's gone. And, and it goes back to that line. I quoted it in the recap and and I'll quote it here. And Jeff, I don't know if we're getting to this part of the, the conversation or not, but you know, he said without forgiveness, you can't mourn and without mourning, you can't let go. And it was such a beautiful line that I think is full of so much wisdom. And I don't even know what to do with it, Jeff. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it was so good. It was so good. Well, I think, I mean, outside of the philosophy, right. And the mindset Mm -hmm. and the, the life lesson in there, just the storytelling. I went back after I watched this episode the second time, I went back and I rewatched the end of born to the purple when she had that conversation with, with her dad and watched him die. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, hey, it was one of the first, hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. are you hearing that? I, I am. Yeah. It, it just went off. You what? It just went off. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Okay. What? Well, yeah. I, because oh. I was hearing that. I'm assuming that's getting into the recording. So I, I didn't, watch yeah. it. it's, it's gone now, whatever was it like, a oh, it's going to be back. That's the garage opening. I'm right above the garage. So we're gotcha. going to give that a couple little bit and then uh, couple they'll, of, they'll Hey YouTube, again. welcome to how we right. produce the show behind the scenes. I don't know what you were this just saying there, but happens. you're going to want to go back to the beginning of that statement. Yeah. I got to remember uh, where, for, I, for where I started. It. I was saying, I don't even know what to do with it. I just think it's a super, cool, uh, yeah. super cool thing. Yeah, beyond philosophy. Philosophy. Mm-hmm. Just gotta wait for them to so hold on to that car. moment while we wait for the garage door to shut. I can hear them opening and closing doors, so that's good. We have cousins staying mm-hmm. the night, and my incredible wife uh, took them to go do ice cream so we could record this, but we're still recording, so <laughs> this go. might not be the end of this. But hey, we're close. We're close. So. Mm-hmm. In fact, do you have anything outside of this piece we can jump into closing? No, no, this is it. I, I mean, yeah. yeah, this is this is me transitioning cool. yeah. to it. So I'll hit this piece and then we'll we'll transition in. As soon as she shuts the door, go ahead and do this. Hey, honey, please shut right. the door now. Uh-huh. <laughs> you shut the garage. 
please. All right. And then chill. Yeah, that'll be good. But she's probably helping get stuff out of the car. I hope yeah. they had fun. We had a really cool new ice cream place open here in town, and so she took the kids there. Mm. Yeah. Which means I'm probably not going to get any ice cream. Mm. <laughs> Which is fine, I guess. My mm -hmm. doctor would think it was fine. There you go. So, Jeff, seen any good movies lately? As we wait no. on this? I, I really haven't, actually. How about you? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, I went to see Thor Love and Thunder. Was that good? Not too long ago. Yeah. It was in many ways completely ridiculous. But I enjoyed the Thor it. movies great. Yeah, like I mean, especially the the new ones with uh Taika Watiti as the director and this mm -hmm. new path they've taken Thor on. They're so out, out of left field, but they're they're a lot of fun, which is what honestly a comic book movie should be. Totally. It's a lot of fun, but it's also got a lot of heart and it's a lot of pathos. Uh oh, there it goes. There goes the garage. Yep. Um that's even and, through the noise uh, gate. Like that, that thing's loud. Yeah. There you go. Oh, hey, there we go. All right. Uh, let's anyway, do this. I, if you're into Marvel, it's good. Uh, the only thing I'll say is I need Marvel to slow down on these series. They keep putting out on Disney plus because trying to keep up with the movies and the series and everything that's going on is really giving me a headache. And I feel like I'm missing stuff that I just don't want to miss. And sometimes I feel like these series just could have been a movie. Right? I didn't Tell need a series. The, make make the movie for Disney Plus. That's fine. I don't need a theatrical release for all of them, but I I also don't need a six, seven, eight part series on it either. Yeah. That's all, all I right. have to say about that. We're talking about this. Back to Babylon five. Yes. I don't know. I don't even know what to do with that. I just think it's really cool. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to cut it way back to the original one you did. I sure I got this. I, I was just it. trying to give you a lead in for it. So that's good. Well, I think it's more, I mean, if we look at this as more of the philosophy of everything or even just, Oh God, I, I totally lost. Uh, <laughs> I lost, I lost the point altogether and I had a really good one. So we were talking about, wow, I'm so sorry, YouTube. This is awful. What was the point you were making? I was hoping you would remember. No. Um, that that Ivanova, Ivanova, Ivanova went through this process and she was able to finally mourn. And there was that line that he said of without, um, oh, without forgiveness, yep. you cannot mourn. And without mourning, you can't let go. And that's just a super cool bit of wisdom that I think a lot of us really could learn from. And I didn't even know really what to do with it, but I think that we can learn from that. Like people hold on to stuff and, and frankly, you just got to be able to release it sometimes and let it go. And yeah, that's what I was talking about when you got into yeah, that. And I mean, I don't know what to do with that either, but if you look at it beyond the philosophy, if we kind of take that and the, the mindset that you can have, which is incredible and let's just rewind it and bring it way down and just look at the storytelling of Babylon five in this. So I, I went back after I watched this for the second time and I rewatched the end of uh, born to the purple when mm -hmm. Ivanova talked to her dad and watched him die. And there were two things I really pulled out of that. One was that they reshot the conversation with her dad for this. So he was able to give a little more context, but everything he said in the one we saw here was said in a different way. So like real great continuity. And they both ended like his, his last words were forgive me. And then thank you. And it was, oh, I mean, it was a gut punch then, but now that like we've watched a lot of her mourning, it was so great. But when she broke down, when she was mm -hmm. like watching him die and, and maybe I'm just reading into this, but like you could see the whole thing where she was so sad that he had died. And I think she felt close to forgiveness, but wasn't there. And I think a lot of her tears were because she wasn't there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. she felt, she felt guilty or bad that she yeah. wasn't ready to forgive. She got the opportunity here because she has literally the galaxy's greatest rabbi. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's that yeah, awesome I, Babylon five storytelling we've been told about for so long. I feel like now I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it happen. I remember when my father passed away, my biological father, uh, for that little bit of Brent history, my dad was never a part of my life. Like I can count on one hand, the number of times I saw him growing up, you know what I mean? And when I was, when I was a young 20 something, he moved back to town where I was. And like anybody, I naturally wanted a relationship with my dad and that went okay for a very short amount of time. And then he full on rejected it. Um, the last two words he ever said to me were F you. Wow. And that was through an intubator. <laughs> he was fully intubated and he said it through that to me. Those the last two words he ever said to me when it came time for his funeral. I of course went because honestly I was, and I, I said at the time, I was like, I'm here for everybody else. I'm not here for me. This was not a man that I knew. This was not a man that I could honestly say that I loved, you know, he was still my dad though. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he's still my father, like yeah. for all his faults and all of that, he still is who he is and that there's nothing that can change that. And I remember, you know, like I never grieved. I never anything, you know, he had a, uh, his wife at the time who one of the best human beings I've ever known in my life. And I don't know what she ever saw in him, but she's awesome. Uh, love her to this day. I love her still in contact with her anyway. Um, you know, she was very much in grief. And I remember I was literally the last one in the funeral home, funeral parlor where they were holding it. And I just sort of like, I went over and I just sort of stood over his coffin. I was the only one in the room. And I, I had that moment that Ivanova had that, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. and it was, and it lasted for uh, Jeff. I don't know that it lasted for five seconds, but it was, it was just a, like, he's gone. This is done the whole thing. And there's, there was a, there was a moment of like, we will never have a relationship now. There is no more chance for that. I, I think there was, that was it for me. Yeah. Was, was, uh, I always still kind of held out hope that maybe we could have something as a, as a relationship, even though, um, even though it wasn't great and it's not like he ever really mistreated me. He just, he wasn't a great person. Um, frankly, uh, and, and I think there was just the, I don't care who he is or what he's done. That's still my father. There's still that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Her, her that, that sort of almost guttural, just like, Oh my God. Like, you know what I mean? I, like I felt that in such a moment, but it was a letting it go, mm -hmm. like a a letting physical. go. Of it. Yeah. 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 And it, it just seems so natural. And like, like I got it, you know? And I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I've ever honestly done the work that Ivanova, uh, Ivanova, I'm sorry. I keep putting restaurants here. I don't know that I've ever done the work. I certainly never sat in Shiva. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. not for this guy. I ain't going <laughs> to forgive him. He never asked for it. <laughs> you know, at least yeah. this dude asked for it. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing. And it's not that I'm withholding it. I just like, I don't like, I, I don't, I've just never done the work on it. But anyway, it was such a cool moment. Um, Jeff, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's boil it down. Let's get to that okay. spot. Um, where we talk about the messages, let's apply that filter. Let's apply that lens that we've gained as, as longtime Star Trek podcasters where we overanalyze the episode and we look for the messages. We look for what it's saying. Does it hold up a mirror? Does this have that, that hope of the future, that star Trek like quality? How many deltas do you give this episode, Jeff? And do you think you should have watched it sooner? I do think I should have watched this sooner. I will watch this episode again. And for deltas, we'll get there. I think you've done such a great job describing the power of forgiveness and how well this episode um communicated that and showed it but i want to talk about how i feel this was an episode that was about honoring respecting reconciling celebrating different cultures right so rabbi mm -hmm. yasel eating treal you know that was such a cool moment where he's like is this kosher and she's like well i don't know he's like well tora doesn't say anything about treal so i'm gonna <laughs> do it just goes in we saw sinclair honor the jewish faith and tradition and then ivanova 
right? Reciprocate that by doing the Kaddish in, mm -hmm. in English. We saw Smith learn the traditions of the Mutai, follow them and respect them. That whole scene, that whole, the training montage, the fight, everything was Rocky IV. The way sure. the crowd came around, Gior showing respect at the end and him starting the chant for Smith, Smith, Smith. Yeah. That was the point on it, just like Ivanova praying in English was the point on that mm -hmm. story. One of the things I really love about Star Trek is that it shows us that every single culture is important and that coming together with different cultures doesn't mean homogenization, right? It's not, right, it's not right. a melting pot. It's, it's diversity and, and all, it's infinite diversity in infinite combinations. I think, I think about Kirk joining Spock in a mock time, Picard and Worf and sins of the father, different cultures and traditions can coexist side by side, but there has to be that core level of respect and Star Trek shows Quark that fighting for Grethel or whatever. <laughs> exactly. In the house of Quark. Yeah. There's so right, many examples. Right? This episode did exactly that. I think this episode is all Star Trek. I am giving this five deltas. What about you? Man, I love it. I love it. I did not consider anything that you just said. And I wow, love okay. every bit of what you just talked about. Cause I 100% agree. That that is that is a huge piece of where this goes, and what this is all about. To me, this episode, though you you said it, and you guys have heard me say it multiple times, this episode was all about forgiveness. I did a little tracking to see where all forgiveness was found throughout the course of this episode. Oh wow, Walker, we have talked about this one. Walker had to come to Garibaldi to ask for forgiveness for something that he did. You know, you just a little pop off. Hey, I forgive you right away, no problem. The rabbi had to ask Ivanova for forgiveness for meddling in her affairs, right? Ivanova, in order to get to where she needed to be, she needed to forgive her father. We saw the memory of her father asking forgiveness of Ivanova. Please forgive me, or of Ivanova. Oh, my gosh. She, he physically asked for forgiveness. And then even in the end, in the, the Mutai thing, uh, the Muktai, the public forgave Walker. The public had this opinion of who he was. He went out there and proved, improved whatever he proved and they start chanting his name. And he even got his little bit on the news and who knows what that's going to come, come about as well. But at least as far as we can see now, I don't know. Somebody out there is probably like, Oh yeah, just wait for three episodes when Walker gets back and he's being slammed by the confederation company and right. stripped of whatever, like, Something like that. Like, I don't know. But as far as we leave the episode right now, that's the impression that I'm left with. I thought that there was this beautiful, weird juxtaposition of this violent of all violent fights, which honestly wasn't that violent, um, being fought and intercut with a service that is remembering a person who was known as a man of peace. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I thought it was just this weird way. And like, she's seeking forgiveness through this while this fight's going on. It was just a weird cut back and forth, but it worked every bit of it worked. And I really want to go back and, and I'd like to, if I had more time before doing this, I would have, I would have done it. But even more so now that I'm thinking about it, I want to go back and watch that sequence again, because I wonder if there's something that's happening with Ivanova with the Shiva thing that somehow matches what's going on with Walker in the fight. Yeah. I could be reading way too much into that. I fully am acknowledging that right now, but I wonder if they wrote it in such a way that maybe that's why they cut it the way they did, you know, yeah. uh, because I think this, this episode is one big ball of a message of saying, Hey, people be like this. Don't be people who hold on to grudges. Be people who forgive. I love what you said. Be people who honor other people's customs and cultures. I love that too. I don't know if I've ever given any episode five stars. Maybe I have. Maybe I did mine or War Prayer. Uh, I think the we DC did. Fontana yeah. episode. Yeah. I'm going to agree with you. This is a five star or five Delta episode. This is so star trek 
it may not be a message that Star Trek has ever really done, at least not in this way, but this is the type of message that the world needs to be hearing. This is the type of TV we need to have on for people to sit down and watch together, which is something we say on beam me up all the time. Like we need to sit down as a world and collectively watch this because it's that, uh, it, it means that much. Well, that's TKO next week. We oh, just TKO TKO. We did. Boom, boom, boom. TKO. TKO. There's my Mario <laughs> reference. There we go. <laughs> we have toys here. We have toys. It's yes. great. Like I said earlier, we don't look at the next episode. We just see the name and that's it. Next episode is called Grail. Now, Brent, we guess what these are, what they're going to be about based on the name alone. So Brent, what do you think Grail is going to be about? If this isn't a rip on Indiana Jones and the last crusade, I am going to riot. This is the one <laughs> I, this, this has to be, I mean, dude, I called TKO. I'm calling this one. This has to be like, they're off searching for some sort of a holy. I don't know that it has to physically be a grail, but some sort of a grail type object. And they're there. It's a, it's a treasure hunt. It's an adventure. I want to see Nazis show up. Um, I, I mean, everything I want to see the greats. I want to see the knight who's going, he chose poorly. Like I want to, I want to see all of it. It better be a complete and total rip on Indiana Jones and the last crusade. It can't be anything else. <laughs> you know I mean? I, it's grail. There's grail doesn't mean anything else. And this is when did last crusade come out? Like this is in 89. I think it yeah. was. So we're still in yeah. the, we're in the sphere of all of that. I, oh, absolutely. I wanted, yeah. Yeah. I wanted really badly to be like, oh, this is going to be, uh, so, but yeah, no, this is going to be some sort of a grail hunt of some kind. There's yeah. no way it's not, Yeah. but we're going to find out right here next week. Thank you so much for joining us here. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us. And if you're on Apple podcasts, pod chase or anywhere else, leave us a review, but say some stuff in there and we'll share it here on the next podcast episode. So until next time, Jeff, you're not going to do it again. Are you stroke off, man? Seriously. Oh, you know what? You need one of those zoom burgers and a Talaxian ale toss in a Zima and we'll live long. And Jeff, Jeff, Hey, stop. I got it. I got it. Let's solve this whole thing. Let's just do the hand thingy and call it good. But the, but the, Podcast people won't be able to see it. That's okay. The YouTube people will. Oh, okay. And prosper. This is my first time. Thanks, YouTube. You got quite a show today. <laughs> You had like the world's longest, but we're just waiting for our garage door to shut people. Uh, welcome sorry. to pod. This is glorious podcasting. This is it guys. This is how it works. <laughs> right. Well, here. listen, I have a wife, kids and cousins downstairs with ice cream YouTube. It's been great. We'll see you next time. Bye guys.